uh, we're looking at John chapter number 4. We were uh, preaching a different message, and Lord willing, we will uh, be back there tonight. Amen. So if you came this morning uh, to finish up the message from last week, uh, you'll have to come tonight to hear that. Amen. Uh, but this morning, I believe that it would be the will of the Lord uh, for us to jump back into this passage here in uh, John chapter number 1 that uh, we began the Sunday prior uh, to when the church had the Pastor Appreciation Weekend uh, for me and my family, which, by the way, you blew us away, and we thank you so much for, and still uh, still trying to come to church with, uh, uh, tr still trying to come to grips, rather, church, with how good and how kind you were to me and to my family. But the Sunday prior to uh, that weekend, we began here in John chapter number 1, and we spent an entire Sunday, uh, Sunday of services, Sunday morning and Sunday night, uh, here in John chapter number 1. And we began to look at here uh, a fault that we find in these verses, in particular uh, in verse number 29, as we find uh, that John the Apostle is writing of another man by the name of John that we have called uh, John the Baptist, that is called John uh, Baptist in the Scripture. And so when we look at this passage, uh, we understand that John the Apostle is writing of John the Baptist in his ministry and the purpose of his ministry and how uh, God used him. And in the Sunday morning service that day, uh, we, uh, I don't know if you remember that service, uh, but God, uh, God uh, led me to go away from what I had prepared, and we simply spent the Sunday morning talking about the importance of a man like John the Baptist in the Scripture, and uh, how God had filled him with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, how John was a fulfillment of an Old Testament passage in Isaiah, uh, talking about how that Christ would have uh, someone that God would fill with his spirit and use uh, to be the forerunner of the Lord that would prepare a way for Christ to come and prepare uh, the way for his ministry uh, to the world. And John, uh, the Bible says, was John the Baptist, John, the Bible says, uh, was the fulfillment of that prophecy. And so we talked about how important he was uh, in the scripture and how God used him and how God touched his life and uh, how uh, amazing it is that God can touch a human being's life and use that man in such a way, use that woman, use that child in a way that God used this human being uh, that we have called throughout church history and even in the Word of God, uh, John the Baptist. And we made some points along the way as the Lord led. Uh, but then on that Sunday night service, we began to jump uh, into this passage and uh, we began to center in on the theme verse of this series of messages, and that is verse number 29, uh, where the Bible says, In the next day John seeth Jesus, Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And we began to present a series of messages that I've entitled, Beholding Like the Baptist. And we see here that John, we call it that because John, uh, not because of religious denomination that we uh, are a part of, amen. And, and I, have no, I have no problems telling you I'm a Baptist. You walked in a Baptist church this morning, amen. I'm thankful uh, for the heritage that I have and the, the doctrine that we uh, stand for. But here uh, we're talking about a man that uh, has made a ministry of baptizing and is currently uh, in a moment of baptizing by uh, immersion here as people are repenting of their sins and turning to uh, God and, and looking for a Messiah that's coming. John was there in this uh, Bethbarren region of the ancient world and he was baptizing and he uh, as one by the, uh, by the waters of baptism looked looks out into a crowd, sees Jesus Christ coming to him, and he points that crowd with the, points out Jesus to that crowd and tells them to behold the Lamb of God which taketh away uh, the sin of the world. And so we, we began to talk about that, and uh, really on that Sunday night service, we uh, just centered in on that word behold, and what, uh, what John was telling them as God led him, amen. You see, when they came to the side of that, uh, those baptismal waters, all eyes were on John. Uh, they were looking at John, but John told them, don't look at me. Turn your eyes upon uh, uh, the Lamb of God, he says, and he points them to Jesus in uh, that regard. We saw that behold was a uh, curious word that we don't use very much in our vernacular uh, today, our terminology today, but it has all kinds of powerful truth to teach us. It was a, a curious word, but it was a, a current word because it is a word
word that demanded immediate action. Amen. It was a constant word because behold doesn't mean take a passing glance, but it means to observe. It means to study. It means to keep your eyes on. In other words, there's something about Jesus Christ, amen, that you don't want to look away from. Amen. When you turn your eyes on him, don't turn it to him and back to me. No, you've turned your eyes on someone that's worthy to keep your eyes on. Amen. You keep looking at him. It's a constant word. It was a concise word. It wasn't a string of uh, commands, but it was one simple command. And that's what made it not only a concise word, but a clear word. What John was telling them was, was that there was nothing in him that was important enough to be the center of their attention. But there was everything in Jesus Christ that would cause him uh, to be deserving of their lasting attention. And so we saw that. Amen. Uh, he did not give them those words uh, with any pretense, but to point them uh, to an opportunity that they would miss if they missed out on Jesus. And I'm telling you, we're living in a world today where there's people that are missing out on the joy uh, of, of knowing who Jesus is, not just a painting on a wall, uh, not just a Last Supper mural, uh, not just a religious uh, uh, figure, amen, but the true Jesus Christ for how John saw him and how we ought to see him. When John looked at him, he understood that he was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sin of the world. And that's the way the world needs to see him. That's the way the lost need to see him. And child of God, can I say this? That's the way we ought to see him as well. If you, if you, rem if you, uh, if you remember in your life something about Jesus, amen, chances are your view and your visage and your knowledge of him had to start from a place where you saw that he was the Lamb of God. If it doesn't start there, then chances are you're probably not a born again Christian. You've got to realize that he was your sacrifice. That should be the first glimpse you get at Jesus is that he loved you enough to die for you in your place as God's sacrificial lamb. Amen. And so we saw that and in seeing that uh, we presented to you the thought that I entitled the demand of this declaration as we uh, behold Jesus as John declares that he saw Jesus in verse number 29. We see the demand that he made in that word behold. It is a statement of demand and he is letting them know you must do this or miss out on the greatest opportunity that mankind has ever had the opportunity to enter into. Amen. This morning I want us to go beyond this word behold here and move on to the next phrase in verse number 29 and that is the phrase where he says the Lamb of God. And I'll be honest with you it's going to take me a few weeks to get through what God's put in my heart on the Lamb of God. I'm telling you that's a bigger subject than you think about. That's a bigger subject. You get down to studying it's a bigger subject than you would care a man to try in one service to uh, to try to uh, to try to make comments on and to try to preach. Amen. I'm telling you it is a statement in the Word of God that not only changes our life but it is vital for a change in our eternity. Amen. And this, this one phrase is wrapped up in thousands of years of Old Testament allusions and all, uh, all many years of, uh, of how God taught Israel to view a lamb and now he is pointing them to uh, the fulfillment of all of those things that took place in the Old Testament. It's a very big subject and I'm not going to try to pour it all onto you today. But the word behold gives us the demand of John's declaration here as we uh, seek to see Jesus as John did. But the phrase the Lamb of God, number two, gives us the direction of this declaration here. We see the demand, but we also see the direction. As we look at the direction of this declaration that John makes, if we want to see, uh, if we want to see uh, Jesus as John saw him, we see that the demand tells us that he, we are uh, to redirect our focus from as here in this passage they were looking at John and John was saying you need to look at Jesus. You and I there are plenty of things in the life that we live that wants to arrest our attention and keep us paying attention to it. Amen. I'm telling you you probably work for a boss. Amen. That wants you to keep your eyes on them. Amen. And I'm telling you I may not be concerned with the things of God or anything like that. Maybe you have a Christian boss. Amen. And that's wonderful. Amen. But work can do it for some if uh, you're not working for a godly uh, boss. Amen. That they want you to be absorbed with 
work instead of the things of God. You may be, amen, have some kind of pleasure in life, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, amusement that you like, that if you're not careful, will draw your eyes away to this uh, fun or this pleasure or this amusement or this good time, this uh, form of entertainment, whatever it may be. I want to arrest your eyes. Amen. By the way, that's what the word amusement means. Amen. Amuse means to think. Amuse means to not think. When you, and I'm not against amusement, amen. Sometimes I like to turn my brain off and not think for a while too, amen. But can I say this this morning? Uh, amusement, the whole idea behind it is to draw your attention to it and make everything else fade away. If we're not careful, we live a life that's filled with amusement and filled with entertainment instead of being a field filled with devotion to Christ, amen, and service to the Lord and faithfulness to Him. There's so many areas and so many things in a world that is so instant and a world that can be uh, right in front of our face at a moment's notice that wants to draw our minds away, that's easy to draw our minds away. This uh, demand to behold, it is, it is, a, it is a, a command in the Scripture or a demand here to take your eyes off of whatever it's on and to turn it upon Jesus. It seems very simple, and it is. But if the demand of this declaration is that the, our focus needs to be redirected, the direction tells us where our focus needs to be redirected to. Not just where, but rather I could say this, upon whom our direction needs to be focused. The, the Bible tells us here that it is very clear that uh, John is telling us that uh, we are to uh, focus our eyes upon Jesus. The Bible says in verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold. The, 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 the direction that John is pointing is upon Jesus. But isn't it interesting that as he gives the direction, he does not tell them, Behold Jesus. It is important that you behold Jesus, but it was not uh, his name that he wanted them to focus on. It wasn't, and you got to understand, uh, this particular crowd in this day, uh, as far as they're concerned, Isaiah said uh, that he had uh, no uh, comeliness, that they should desire him. Jesus looked like the average Jew of the day. Yes, sir. Jesus did not walk around with a glowing, uh, with a glowing halo around his head. He did not, uh, amen, levitate everywhere he went. There was no indicators uh, from a physical bodily standpoint that this was a divine being. You had to get to know the Son of God. You had to be around him for a while before you would look beyond just his physical appearance and truly see the deity within. As Jesus, the Bible tells us uh, that they were there the day before uh, John was also baptized. No doubt the crowd from the day before is here again here in this passage. Verse number 26, John says, uh, in verse 26, John answered them saying, uh, speaking to these religious leaders, he said, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, he says. Yeah. Whom you know not. Yes, sir. He's talking about Jesus there. Yes. He's saying there's one among you that you do not know. He said he it is who coming after me is for preferred before me. Whose shoes latch and I'm not worthy. I'm, I'm not a worthy to unloose. He's talking about Jesus. Jesus was in the midst of them and they were unimpressed by him. They were unimpacted by him. They were unmoved by his presence. And so therefore John points them out and tells them them that they need to see him and notice that he's there, but not just because he is Jesus, the son of Mary, and uh, the son of Mary, and as far as they're concerned, the son of Joseph. Now we know where he, we know who his uh, father line come from God. We know him. Those of us that are saved and believe the Bible I know that he's the son of God, but as far as they were concerned, if they knew anything about him, he was just a carpenter's son from Nazareth. He was just a nobody from nowhere from a part of the world that wasn't very important in the grand scheme of things or so they thought. Just a carp lowly carpenter's son. Not very inner, just nothing to draw them to him. So it wasn't just the name. And we know how precious the name Jesus is uh, now because of the uh, revelation of Scripture. We know that it means Savior. But in this day, the name Jesus was a very common name. 
a name shared by many others. The, if John would have said, Behold Jesus, the crowd most likely would have Jesus who? Yeah. Even if they were, even if John, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say that John pointed a finger when he said it. In my mind's eye, I see him pointing because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say behold and not point people in the direction of who uh, to behold, especially when you're not using a physical name and you're using a term of metaphorical terminology. Amen. Uh, when, when you're doing that, if you're not pointing, who, who is he talking about? Amen. But if he is pointing, and he do, they do turn their attention to the one that John's pointing at. What's so special about him? John does not tell us to behold Jesus, but what he does tell them to do in this passage, those there uh, in that crowd there in Bethabara, he says, behold the Lamb of God. We see here a focus on the Lamb uh, that is mentioned. He tell, he's very, it is very clear who he is telling them uh, that uh, they, uh, who he's telling them that they are to behold. It is very clear who he is speaking of. The Bible says he's speaking of the Lamb of God. Yeah. Now, before I get into a little bit of why that would make such an impact, let me first begin by saying what this chapter alone has to tell us about the Lamb of God. You, and I don't, I'm not going to take the time to preach the different names of Christ uh, here in detail, but here in John chapter number 4, you find multiple names of Christ given in the same chapter. In John chapter number 1, uh, we, we see John chapter number 1 here in our passage this morning. We see John the Apostle and then John the Baptist of whom he is, John the Apostle who is writing this book is giving a quote and giving a testimony of what happened on this day in John the Baptist's ministry as he pointed to Jesus, uh, to be pointed to Jesus out to that crowd in an area where he was baptizing and called him uh, the Lamb of God. Here we find that John the Apostle Apostle and John the Baptist are both very clear in what they're saying and they're both in full agreement and they're talking about the same person. Consider this. As John in verse 29 says, Behold the Lamb of God. It comes you know, right upon the heels of multiple verses that uh, John, before we get into the narrative of this moment in John the Baptist's life and ministry, we have found before that 18 verses of what John had to say about the same one that John the Baptist, that John the Apostle, he's writing about the uh, same one that John the Baptist is declaring before that crowd. I hope that makes sense this morning. Verse 1 through 18 is the exact same subject as verse 19 through 34. In John the Baptist's words, as he is quoted here by John the Apostle's pen, he looks at Jesus and says, the Lamb of God. But this Lamb that is the focus here, this Lamb is one that John the Apostle that is writing this letter, writing this book of Scripture, rather this gospel, had some things to say about himself. He said, number one, that the Lamb that John the Baptist is speaking of John said that this is a lamb who lies like us, who is a person. Notice what the Bible says in John chapter number 1 and verse number 14. Well, let's, let's back up to verse number 11. Speaking about Jesus now, John the Apostle says he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of uh, the will of man, but of God. He's speaking about a spiritual birth, those that are born spiritually, he says. Now notice verse 14. How is it that Jesus can offer a spiritual birth? birth. Notice the Bible says this, verse 14, the Word was made flesh. A name for Jesus in John chapter number 1, the first given to him in this chapter is the Word. In other words, the Word of God made flesh, the Word of God incarnate, the Word of God, the prophecies of God, the promises of God put into a human body crafted by God himself. 
the fulfillment of all of those Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah was put into a body. Yes, it fulfilled what Isaiah said, what God told Isaiah to prophesy, that a virgin shall conceive. Amen. And they'll call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. It wasn't just a promise that did not happen. It was not just a prophecy, but it came to pass in the person of Jesus Christ, the one that John the Baptist pointed them to. They called him the Lamb of God. John said he was the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Now notice who the glory belongs to. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Amen. He, the Bible says, when the Bible says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, the Bible said that as John points out the Lamb, that the one that's going to be qualified to be the Lamb also has to match. Amen. This is the same subject here that John the Apostle and John the Baptist are dealing with. They have to match. If the Lamb of God is going to be that true Lamb of God, then He's also got to be just like us in the form of His physical personage. He's got to be a man. The Lamb of God is not, think about this now, the Bible calls Him a Lamb. And there were, throughout Old Testament history, thousands of lambs that did a work for God, if you want to call it that way, in being sacrificed. They were God's lambs. Amen. But here the Bible tells us that there is a Lamb of God that must be a person. That is God's fulfilled Word put in a body of flesh that dwells among human beings just like us. The Bible says that He was a Lamb that was a person just like us. He, the Bible tells us over and over again, John 14, tells us that he uh, was a, a man. John, or excuse me, John 1, 14, excuse me. John 1, 26 says this. John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. How could he be among them, amen, if he was not a physical person? The Bible said, verse 27, he, it is. And I know we're living in a world that is handling the use of pronouns like he and she in a very crazy and unscriptural way. But can I say this this morning when the Bible in verse 27 says that Jesus was a he, God meant what he said when he said what he did. He was a man. He was a person. The Lamb of God must be like us, a person. But John the Apostle also tells us in concordance with what John the Baptist says that the Lamb of God not only must be like us, a person, but the Bible says that the Lamb of God being spoken of here must be a light, a provider of truth. Notice what the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 6. Now remember, this is John the Apostle talking about uh, John uh, the Baptist. Amen. Notice what the Bible says here. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The apostle's not speaking of himself. He's speaking of John the Baptist. Verse 7, the same came for a witness to bear witness of, notice what the Bible says, the light. Amen. Now, do you notice there in your Bible that L on that L-I-G-H-T, light, is capitalized? It means that it's not talking about these. If you put this in print and you say, I turned the light on at Beacon Baptist Church, you've got to do a little L-I-G-H-T for you to do a capital L is very, very improper grammar. But can I say this here in our Bibles this morning? We do not find improper grammar. We do not find a mistake in the Bible. This was not a typographical error. This was not a printing error. This is not an error in any way, shape, or fashion. The reason why the L on light is capitalized is because this is being used as a name. It is a proper noun. The same way that in verse number 1 and even in the verse that we read just a moment ago, verse number 14, the word word was capitalized. It's because that the word the, that Christ here in verse 14 was called the Word. It was being given as His name. And here in verse number uh, 7, the Bible is saying for us that a name for this man that John the Baptist would point out is the Lamb of God. It's pointing out that the Lamb of God has to be a light from God. 
the same. The Bible said came, verse 7, for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, speaking about John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Can I say this this morning? The reason why in these verses Jesus is being given, the, given as a name for himself, as another name of Christ, as the light, because in uh, biblically speaking, the only way that you will ever have light in this life is when you have it in accordance with the Lord Jesus Christ. I told our Sunday school class this morning talking about the importance of the church, the local church, and what the word church means in the Bible. It means a called out assembly. And I asked them the question, and I tried to get them to answer. Now, they were too scared to answer, amen, or timid, and maybe didn't know the answer. But if the church is a called out assembly, I asked them the question, what does that mean? If we are an assembly, we all know what assembly means, getting together and, and being together, being unified uh, in one place. But what does it mean for the church to be called out? And the answer I gave them was, the, was this answer, that it means that we have been, in our salvation, we were called out from the world. We were called, the Bible says we were called out of darkness and into His marvelous light. We were called out of the family of the devil and being a child of Satan, and we were brought into the family of God. I'm glad this morning that as a child of God, there are a lot of things that I've been brought out of. And I'm glad not only was I brought out of some things, but I'm thankful this morning that God's brought me into some things, amen, that I need for my life here and for eternity to come. Amen. We've been called out from darkness. For you, you said before Christ, all we ever had was darkness. For you to be saved and have the light of God in your life, to be able to have the Word of God, what is the Word of God in our life? It is light. The Bible says this in the Psalms, Psalm 119, 105, the Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. How is it that the word gives us light? It's because it's God's word. And my future and your future as well is a very sh outside of heaven for the child of God. I'm talking about physically in this life is still a very shadowy, dark subject. We don't have knowledge of it. But the Word of God, day by day, allows our steps to be a little bit brighter. And it gives us direction for the next step, and for the next step, and for the next step. For us to have that in our life, for the Word of God to be able to give us that, it means that there, the source of that book has to be a light that illuminates. For your life to be a light for Christ, there's got to be another source in your life for you to be able to give light. Because without Christ we are all sitting in worlds of sinful darkness. You know, I'm not much of an astrologer. <laughs> Y'all look at me and tell that. I was born in Calpin, South Carolina. And I don't know if any astrologers come out of Calpin. <laughs> I graduated high school with a guy who was a nuclear engineer, but outside, he wasn't from Calpin. He was from Packland. Amen. So, amen. Town like that, not a whole lot of hope for, amen, our resumes at least. I mean, it's just a town. I couldn't help it. My parents lived there. But at the same time, it don't look good for my intelligence on a resume. <laughs> Uh, Calpin, South Carolina. But the South is bad enough when some people look at you. Hey Amen. Then you got to be from a place called Calpins. But, you know, in the universe, the universe that we live in, there the Bible talks about that we have a great, that God created a greater light to rule the day. That's the sun, the lesser light to rule the night. And then he created the stars also. Do you realize, and I know you do, you're smart enough, you know this, the moon does not have light in and of itself. It reflects the light from the sun. The reason why we have light at nine is because there somewhere the sun is shining and our moon is reflecting that light. That's exactly what you and I do, and that's exactly what God does in us. We don't have light in and of ourselves. 
But Jesus is the light. What the S-U-N does in our universe, the S-O-N does all throughout this world. And people that are saved, I, I hope you're saved. And if you are, people like me and people like you, when we make a difference for God in somebody's life, when we represent Him and God uses us in any way, all we're doing is we are reflecting the light, not of the S-U-N, but of the S-O-N to the person that we are ministering to. Jesus is the light. John here, John the Baptist calls him the Lamb. John the Apostle called him the light. So in other words, as these two men are talking about the same person and their, their narrative comes within the same chapter of God's Word, whoever this Lamb of God is, and we know who it's being pointed to, the Bible says that that person must be like us. He must be a person, but he also must be a light, a provider of truth. And I, I say a light, a provider of truth, because the Bible, when the Bible says in verse number, uh, when the Bible says there in verse number nine, that that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. That does not mean every man that's ever been born gets saved. What it does mean, though, is that they don't die and go to hell without light. There's truth available to them. There is the light of God's Word that is available to them. And you can say, preacher, what about those on far distant continents and those that don't have a Bible in their language? I'm telling you, I believe, and I believe Romans chapter 1 bears it out. I believe with all of my heart, if there's someone who lives in a country, who lives in a jungle, who lives in, 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 a, in, a, in a mud hut somewhere, and they do not know the truth, but they look up in the night sky and they see a moon and stars and said, I'd live, say in their heart, I sure would love to know how all of that comes to me, I, I believe it with all of my heart that if there is someone that says, I want to know the truth, that our God is big enough and all powerful enough and all knowing enough that He knows what's in that person's heart, and it will be before long that God will send a missionary to that land that will tell them you look up in the night sky and you see the stars and you see the moon and you see the sun shining in the day. I'm here to tell you that there's a God that created that sun, that there's an all powerful God that created that moon. There's an old powerful God that flung those stars up in place and is holding them there. And I'm here to represent that God and to tell you more about what that God has for you. Amen. You may not believe that and that's okay. I believe it enough for the both of us. I'm telling you, I believe with all of my heart. Amen. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3, 9 that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that that does not just mean us Americans. Amen. And I, hey, aren't you glad for that this morning? We got two men here from Canada this morning visiting with us. Amen. I'm glad the gospel's not just for Americans. I'm glad it reaches our neighbors to the north. Amen. There in Canada. I'm glad it reaches our neighbors to the south there in Mexico. I'm glad that all over the world there's truth available. And if it was not for this Lamb of God, that is the true light. It wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be able to be possible. Jesus, if he was not a man, could not be this Lamb of God that John is speaking about. Because this Lamb of God, if He's going to die for your sins and mine, as the Bible says here, which taketh away the sin of the world in verse 29, if He's going to take man's sins away, He's got to be just like us in the terms of humanity. Old, the Old Testament saints already learned and the children of Israel already learned that you can only go so far with the atonement from animals. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission but animals blood only goes so far. The Bible here says that, it ha that this Lamb of God has to be one that, is, that has been made flesh and dwells among us. This Lamb of God, it would not be possible for Him to be the Lamb of God that John the Baptist said He would be if He was, if he was not the light that illuminates truth and let people know what's right and where they spiritually stand in need of, what they stand in need of. He's a light, a provider of truth. Let me preach this and then I'll be done. Can I say this? I'll have to pick up more down the road, whether tonight or next week. Number next, whatever it is, number three. 
When the Bible here is talking about the Lamb of God, John the Baptist calls him the Lamb. John the Apostle had some other things that he was telling us about. And it's, it's, it, it's not possible for him to be the Lamb of God without being those other things. When he speaks of the Lamb, he is speaking of one who is lasting and preferred before all. Notice what the Bible says in John 1.30. John chapter number 1 and verse number 30. Notice what the Bible says about him here. Right after John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, the Bible describes this Lamb. And it says, John said, This is he of whom I said, talking about a past event. You see, this isn't the only time that John's been talking about Jesus. It seems to me like John the Baptist talked about the Messiah, talked about the Lamb of God, talked about the Christ that was coming everywhere he went. By the way, you and I ought to be talking about Jesus everywhere we go. Amen. It ought to be the most common conversation you have in life. Amen. If you talk about how high the gas prices are more than you do Jesus, there's a problem. Amen. And I'm that's a subject I hear everywhere I go. I I don't go to a restaurant. I don't sit in the doctor's office. I don't walk to a store without here. I could go to a store and it'd be me and one other person on the, in the whole store. And I promise when I walk by that other person, they're going to be on the phone talking about how high the gas prices are. Amen. <laughs> if that's all we talk about, we've missed it. You and I as the children of God are called to be what John the Baptist was. And that was a witness of the light. Amen. A witness of the Lamb. Here the Bible tells us this is he of whom I said. A past record. By the way, he mentioned in verse 15 and he mentioned in verse 27. Verse 15 he said, John bear witness of him and cried saying, this is he of whom I spake. Amen. Again, even in verse 15 as far back as we go in this chapter that mentions it, he's talking about going further back. Amen. Yeah. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 27, he it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I'm not worthy to unloose. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. What does it mean that this Lamb of God is preferred before John? Yes, we understand the word preferred means that he is regarded above others, that he is elevated in his a station that he is above John in many ways. That's the way we understand this word. And it's true. But the Greek word here that we find translated in our New Testament is our New Testament is translated from Greek into English here. The Greek word does not use it in the way that we use it. It keeps the English definition in terms of regarded above others, elevated in station or status. It does that, but the Greek word gets to the reason why he's elevated. Why is he preferred? Why is he above John? Here's what the Greek word means. It lit, now, I, I'm, not, I'm not reading something you have in the newspaper now. I'm telling you this is exactly what it means. The word preferred in the Greek originally meant, when it was originally written, it means to come into existence or being. It means to arise, to appear in history. It literally means to come upon the stage. That's what preferred means. When John is saying, he is preferred before me, for he was before me, those two statements go together hand in hand. Why is he elevated? Why is Jesus better than John? And why is he better than all of us? It's because he came into existence first. If I can use it. Jesus didn't have to come into existence. He's always been in existence. He is God. The Bible said he's, he's the Word made flesh. He's God's Word put in a human body. He is the Son of God. He is, he is Christ. He is the Jewish Messiah that they were waiting on. When the Bible says that he is preferred before me, it means that he came upon the stage of history prior to me. Now, that's an interesting statement that John makes. John the Baptist considering the fact that Jesus being the son of Mary was physically according to the flesh the cousin of John the Baptist and he was not the older cousin Jesus came forth Luke chapter number 2 six months after John the Baptist was born in Luke chapter number 1 John the Baptist is six years older than Jesus, or six months rather, six months, excuse me, I hope I didn't say years a minute ago, six months older than John the Baptist, and he is saying he was before me. He came upon the scene of history before me. 
John is not talking about breaking forth the matrix of his mother. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, in other words, he's saying before, John is saying before I ever came around, I came into existence one day. Jesus was born six months after me, but he has never not been in existence. Right. He's never not been around. He's talking about a God. He's, this Lamb of God has to be a being that is eternal. I'm telling you this morning that when, when John pointed at Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, there was nobody else in that crowd that he could have pointed to. There was no one else that he could redirect them to. Jesus is the only one that meets these qualifications. He's the only one that is born in flesh as a human being. That uh, There's plenty of people in the crowd that met that. But when you move on to being light, being the one that, that, that provides truth and gives truth, somebody in that crowd may, that may, have looked, may have been able to look at the Pharisees there and say, well, they're a light to us. They tell us about the Word of God. They, they tell us about uh, the, the Scriptures. They, they're real. They're, they're people, and they provide us with truth. But only one in that crowd was preferred before John in the sense that he's never not been. We'll see some more of these tonight. But can I say this? When it comes to looking at the Lamb of God this morning, the one that loved you enough to be God's Lamb, to lay His life down, to shed every drop of His blood, to allow Himself to be beaten at the hands of the, on the orders of the Jews and at the hands of the Roman soldiers that allowed His hands to be nailed, uh, hands and feet nailed to a cross that would go up on that cross and He would suffer and bleed and die and suffocate in agony and He bore your sin. He died on that cross not just for you, but as you in your place so you wouldn't have to suffer the wrath of God. The one that did that for you, you can't look to anybody else but Jesus Christ today. And I hope if you're here this morning and you're not saved by the grace of God, you'll do what John said do. Behold the Lamb of God. Look at Jesus Christ. See Him for who He is. See His love for you. See His qualifications that make Him worthy of being your Savior. Place your faith in Him. Trust Him today. And if you're here and you've already done that, then maybe you, want to, might, you might just need to take time this morning and, and worship our Savior for being the Lamb of God that took your sin away and for letting you one day realize through some gospel witness whatever your eyes were on were not as important as what Jesus had for you and the Spirit of God took your attention off of whatever it was on and it turned your eyes upon Christ and let you see Him as the Lamb of God for your sins and when you trusted in Him He gave you all, uh, all that you would ever need for life and eternity and somebody might need to take time today and say thank you God for being the Lamb of God and letting me in on that truth so I didn't have to die and go to hell. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm done preaching this morning.